Hi, this is Dr. Claire, and this is our lecture on conservation biology. So in this lecture, we're going to be talking about what's driving species extinctions and what solutions there might be. Um, so right now, we are in the sixth mass extinction. Uh, many species are becoming extinct, and the main reasons for these extinctions are humans. Um, and in particular, um, the, the, the things that are causing these species to go extinct are changes that humans are, are uh, causing in the environment. So we call these human-induced rapid environmental change, or HIREC. Um, so that incorporates a, a number of different factors, um, habitat loss, uh, over-exploitation of particular species, introduced species, so species that are moved from one place to another by humans, pollution, and climate change. Okay, So we're going to talk about um, <clears throat> how each of those factors may cause species to come, become extinct. Um, there's also non-human influences as well. Um, so once humans come in and disrupt an environment, then there are other effects within the environment, so ecosystem level effects that might come into play. Um, when you have small populations, you tend to have more genetic drift and loss of genetic variation. And then sometimes a population is damaged by humans, and then the, like the, the final straw is some sort of natural catastrophic event. So we're going to go through some of these different examples and, and give you some examples of, of how these things are, are, um, are affecting species. Um, so we'll start with habitat destruction. Habitat destruction is the largest cause of species declines. Um, humans come in and we want to use the land for what we want to use it for. So we come in and we destru destroy or disrupt um, natural habitats. Um, so we can come in and clear cut uh, timber, um, burning tropical forests and urban and industrial developments, agriculture, all of these things are taking land out of natural habitats and turning it into some sort of altered habitat. Um, so for one thing, that's going to reduce the total amount of habitat that's available, but it also fragments the habitat. Um, and habitat fragmentation is really important because some species need a large contiguous stretch of habitat in order to survive. And if you chop up the habitat into little bitty bits, they won't actually be able to survive. So you have what you call edge effects, where the humidity and the light is different near the edge of a fragment than it is in the middle. And so there are some species that really need a large contiguous stretch in order to survive. So here's a specific example. This is the island of Madagascar off the coast of Africa. Um, it has, it's an amazingly diverse place with many, many species that are only found on Madagascar and no other place in the world. Um, but it had on the eastern coast uh, this band of tropical rainforest, which has been largely destroyed. About 90% of that tropical rainforest has been, um, has been cut down. Um, and that's caused a lot of extinctions. And one group of animals you may have heard of from Madagascar are the lemurs. And of the 31 species of lemurs that are present on Madagascar, 16 of them are either um, endangered or extinct at this point. So it's, and it's that fragmentation of that forest habitat that's really caused these species to decline. Um, Overexploitation is another big one. That's when humans uh, use a animal or plant population for something in a way that is destructive. Um, so we eat animals, um, there are various other, we cut down trees, we use these uh, organisms for things that are beneficial to us, right? Um, and if you remove these organisms from the population faster than they can be replaced through production, then the populations will decline. So. For a lot of uh, uh, oceanic species that we eat, fish species, this is um, really common. Overfishing is a major problem. Um, humans do like to eat fish and we go out into the ocean. We're very good at catching them. So this, this example here is from the Atlantic cod um, that were harvested for hundreds of years um, off the Atlantic coast of U the U.S. And um, cod became very popular in the 60s and 70s, and so the fishing rates increased quite a bit. And then the population crashed. And so they closed the, the cod fishery. And then after a couple of years, they opened again, and the population crashed again. So now there's, um, in, in some places off, in, off the Atlantic coast, the cod fisheries are completely closed because there's just not enough cod there to support any fishing at this point. Um, Another great example is the western black rhinoceros, which is driven, driven to extinction by overharvesting for their horns. Their horns are considered a traditional medicine in some cultures, um, but uh, rhinoceroses don't reproduce very quickly. So when you remove just a few rhinoceroses from the population, um, they, it can gr have a really big effect. And so rhinoceroses have actually been harvested, poached, to the point 
where the some populations like the 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 western black rhinoceros have gone completely extinct um which is really sad and it's it was just harvesting for the horn they cut the horn off and they leave the rest of the rhinoceros there to rot um They've tried various things like making them less attractive to hunters by surgically removing their horns so that um, they're no longer attractive to the poachers. But unfortunately, the horns are really important for protecting the offspring. And so um, females who have their horns removed um, aren't as able to protect their young. And so they, that, that also impacts the, um, the population negatively. <clears throat> another uh, big factor is introduced species. So species that are brought from one place to another by humans. Usually when um, these species come into a new area, their natural enemies are not there. There's nothing that eats them. There aren't any of their normal diseases. And so they can basically grow without any limitation. Um, and that, that can be very detrimental to the native species that are present in that area because they're not adapted to living with this new introduced species. So the top picture here is kudzu. Um, kudzu is a vine that is native to um, Asia. It's a very, very fast growing vine. And this is a picture from the southeastern U.S. where kudzu will completely grow over forests and uh, completely cover the trees with this vine to the point where the trees can't get enough sunlight. And so it, they can, these kudvu, kudzu vines can actually kill the forest. On the bottom we have an example of zebra mussels. Um, so this black uh, crust that you see on top of the little crayfish there, those are uh, thousands and thousands of tiny zebra mussels, which is a type of bivalve, you know, like a, like a clam. Um, obviously that crayfish is not doing so well. So when the zebra mussels get into freshwater bodies, they can take over and um, outcompete uh, many other species um, and do harm to things like, even things like crayfish. They also do harm to human infrastructure like drainages and boat docks and things like that. Um, another example of an introduced species having a big impact is um, in the, um, the honey eaters of Hawaii. Um, and this is a wide diverse group of finch-like birds. Um, and um, birds carry a, a, our birds are susceptible to a disease very much like human malaria. It's sort of avian malaria. Um, and it's only, it only infects um, birds. But like human malaria, it's transmitted by mosquitoes. And uh, historically, there have been no mosquitoes in Hawaii. And so while there was avian malaria present in seabirds in Hawaii, there was no way for it to get to the land birds in Hawaii because there were no mosquitoes to transmit it to the land birds. Unfortunately, humans came to Hawaii, and when they came, they, had, uh, they were coming on boats with big buckets of fresh water to drink on their voyages. And when they would land in Hawaii, they would dump their bucket and scoop up a new bucket full of fresh water. In those buckets were living many thousands of mosquito larvae. And so when they dumped their buckets, they introduced mosquitoes to Hawaii. And then once that vector was there, um, uh, malaria could be transmitted from the seabirds to the land birds. And um, many species of Hawaiian honeycreepers have actually gone extinct. Um, now honeycreepers are really only found um, at very high elevation where, in Hawaii where it's cool and mosquitoes aren't present. Um, so it's been really detrimental to the bird populations on those islands. Pollution, of course, is another really big factor. Um, pollution is any human-caused chemical that contaminates the environment. Um, aquatic environments tend to be particularly sensitive to pollution. Um, and the, the pollutants can either directly affect the animals or it can have an indirect effect. So on the bottom here, we have oiled pelicans. Um, from the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Obviously, that's a direct pollutant that is impacting those pelicans. On the top picture there, though, that is the result of pollution from runoff from agricultural fields. So, um, and it's not the, the runoff itself that is toxic. The runoff contains a lot of phosphorus and nitrogen, which flows into these aquatic ecosystems, causes huge algal blooms, which then die, and when the algal, algae dies, um, bacteria eat it, and when the bacteria eat it, they use up all the oxygen in the water. And so the fish, you have these massive fish kills, where it's not the, the phosphorus and nitrogen that's killing the fish, but the, um, the uh, ecological effects of that phosphorus and nitrogen then that result in a situation where there's no oxygen in the water and all the fish die. 
Um, another classic example of pollution is uh, the example of DDT. DDT was a, an insecticide which was used very heavily in the 50s and 60s for mosquito control. Um, this data here is looking at the bald eagle population in Florida. And in Florida, DDT was used very heavily because in the 50s and 60s, there were still many mosquito-borne diseases that were present in Florida. And so DDT was seen as this way that we were going to save lots of people from these diseases. So they sprayed everywhere um, and to try and kill all the mosquitoes. Um, unfortunately, DDT isn't very harmful to mammals, but it's very harmful to birds. Um, it prevents them from laying uh, proper eggs, and their eggs can be very easily crushed. Um, so here's where DDT was introduced, um, and you can see an immediate crash of the bald eagle population because they just weren't able to reproduce at all successfully with that level of DDT in the environment. Eventually, DDT was banned in 1968, and since that time, the bald eagle population has recovered. So it's pretty clear that this population decline was linked to DDT. <clears throat> the last fact, a human cause factor that I want to talk about is climate change. Um, so as we discussed in our, our lecture on the climate cycle, uh, human production of greenhouse gases are changing the global climate. The data is very uh, clear about this. Um, we are experiencing warmer and warmer temperatures on this planet. Um, so this is the, some, the data from the last 120, 130 years. Um, so as you can see here towards the end, in the last uh, 40 years, there really haven't been any colder than average years. We are in a, in an increasing trend, a very rapidly increasing trend of global um, temperature increases. Um, and it's almost certainly caused by uh, increases in CO2 in the environment. Um, this ha can have impacts on a number of species, uh, particularly species that live in cold environments like the Arctic and the Antarctic. They're particularly susceptible to climate change. Um, these are Adelie penguins. Um, their major food source is krill, a little tiny shrimp, and those krill live underneath the ice sheets in the Antarctic. Um, and the ice sheets are shrinking. Um, because the ice sheets are shrinking, there are fewer and fewer krill, which means the penguins have to travel further and further for food. Um, so they have to travel a long way away from their nests to find food to feed their chicks, and the chicks are starving. So the, the Adelie populations are declining very rapidly. <clears throat> All right, so there are some other factors that can come into play uh, once humans disturb an ecosystem. Um, so let's say we have overexploitation of commercial fish. Um, so the big fish in the, in the ocean are taken out. That's going to cause an increase in little fish and jellyfish, which is then going to cause a decrease in uh, herbivores, which then will cause an increase in algae. Um, so this would be an example of a trophic cascade or a top-down effect on the ecosystem. Um, so do, uh, ha when humans impact one species in an ecosystem, there might be numerous other impacts that are seen in other places within the ecosystem. Um, keystone species, of course, are really, really important for the proper functioning of an ecosystem. This is a cassowary. It is a keystone species that is found in Australia. Um, they are threatened by habitat loss, by um, uh, deforestation. They like a nice, uh, contiguous, old-growth rainforest. They need large stretches of rainforest in order to survive. But the cassowary is a really important seed disperser. They eat all the fruits in the rainforest and um, then they, they, as they pass through the gut of the cassowary, the seeds are prepared to, to, to sprout and um, they actually will germinate better after they pass through the gut of a cassowary. So you can pick up a cassowary poop. This is a cassowary poop with all kinds of um, plants germinating out of the seeds in the poop. You can basically pick up a cassowary poop, put it in a plastic bag, and basically grow a whole rainforest out of it. Um, so without the cassowary, these plants probably would have lower germination rates and a lower success. So they're really important to the functioning of the whole ecosystem. Once you have a small population, they're even more vulnerable to extinction. Um, so here's an example from the dusky seaside sparrow. They're a unique uh, species that are found only in Florida. Um, they were impacted by a number of different human uh, factors. Um, pesticides were sprayed to control mosquitoes and also their habitat was destroyed by development. They happened to live very close to Orlando, Florida. So um, the development of Orlando destroyed a lot of their habitat. So they were down to a very limited amount of habitat. They're being impacted by these pesticides. Um, and then there was a hurricane. 
and the hurricane came through and wiped out a bunch of the individuals. And then they built a highway. And eventually they only ended up with five individuals left in the population, and they were all male. And once you have all males, that's it. You're pretty much done. So the dusky seaside sparrow actually did go extinct. Um, they did capture some of these remaining males and breed them with females of another species to try and keep the genes um, that they might have had that might have been unique in the population. Small populations are also very susceptible to genetic drift. If you cast your mind way back to the beginning of the course when we talked about, um, ab about evolutionary mechanisms, genetic drift is one of our evolutionary mechanisms. It, that's the random change of allele frequencies due to random chance. Um, it tends to lead to reductions in genetic diversity. And when you have a very small population, they're very susceptible to genetic drift. So uh, if a population declines, um, they tend to get very inbred. They tend to have very low genetic diversity. Um, and even if the population recovers and goes back up, that low genetic diversity is going to remain because there's no new source of genetic information until you get mutations building up within the population. Of course, most mutations are bad. So that's going to take hundreds of generations to rebuild that genetic diversity once you have a, a small population size. Um, the example here is the southern uh, elephant seal which was down to a population of only about 60 individuals. And um, they are now extremely genetically homogenous. There's very little genetic, genetic diversity, even though the population has recovered in the absence of hunting. All right, so just want to end on a little bit of an up note. Um, is it too late? Have we damaged the environment too much that we can't recover it? And I'd like to say no. Um, and the, the example that I would like to give is the US itself. Um, earlier in this, in the last century, uh, we had really horrific environmental problems. Um, this picture here is the Cuyahoga River. The Cuyahoga River was so polluted that the river literally caught on fire. Um, California used to be just be ridiculous polluted. There was acid rain uh, that was damaging the forests, and there was just um, so much pollution in the air that you could barely see in LA. Um, and um, these environmental problems led us to pass some key environmental legislation in the 60s, the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act. And since the passage of the Clean Air Act and the Clean Air Water Act, um, we've seen a really dramatic improvement uh, in the environment in this country. So the Cuyahoga River, while it's not a perfect river, is no longer catching on fire. There are actually fish and other animals that live in it now, which they couldn't before. Um, and this graph here is looking at um, air quality in the Los Angeles area uh, after the passage of some very strict um, uh, emissions laws for cars where a lot of these um, damaging pollutants have gone way down. Um, but um, we need to keep, can, keep working on these things. Um, this is a picture of Beijing. This is what Beijing would look like without air pollution. This is, and over here on the left is Beijing on a typical day. So there are parts of the world that are having horrific pollution problems. We are dealing with climate change on a massive scale. Um, and we need to act. And, I, and uh, this is my plea to you to be active, um, to go out there and vote, vote your conscience. Um, it's really important and it's the biggest thing you can do in this country. And, um, and make, make the environment a priority because I think we can make a difference. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed this class. Um, and uh, that's my last lecture for 2017. And I will see you guys next time.